Roddy, thank you for, one, for entertaining us so early in the morning, but uh, what a fascinating uh, uh, perspective and insight into, into our great city and county of Dublin. Thank you so much for taking the time to put that together and your, to share your thoughts uh, with us this morning. Uh, I have some come questions, as I said earlier on, but I'm going to up, open it up to the floor now before we go into our round table discussion. And uh, do we have any questions for Dr. Ruth McManus, uh, for Ruth or for Roddy? And uh, we have roving mics. We have roving mics. I see one at the, uh, the back there, yep. Table 11. If you could just maybe just introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Maria Quill. I just want to know what the population of the county is now, and how it's increased. Hi, I'm Maria. Um, Hi. It's 1.4 million citizens. That's what we believe it is now. In the county. In the in the county, the, the, the county of Dublin. Yeah. All oh, right. The That's whole county. Great. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're just warming up. Uh, we have one here on table two. Hi, thank, thanks. Um, I'm Natasha, thanks. Um, I had a question for Ruth about the Edge City, um, part of Dublin. Um, that was a very interesting talk, thank you. Um, just, I just wondered, is this a particular Dublin phenomenon or is this a global thing where cities are kind of moving into ed the edge city um, scenario. And also, I just wonder, is, is Dublin quite spread out compared to other international cities per popu you know, considering its population? Because it feels to me, I've lived in several you know, international cities, it feels very spread out. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Natasha. Um, yes, edge city is not unique to Dublin. We didn't invent it. Um, I, the, the term was actually coined in the US and um, particularly in the 90s and thereafter. So it is a phenomenon, as, as I sort of mentioned, a lot of the things that we see happening in Dublin are things that happen in lots of cities around the world. So yeah, so Edge City is not unique to, to Dublin, but of course it, it creates Dublin specific problems as well. Uh, in terms of how spread out it is, I suppose it depends on who you're measuring us against. So. If we go to the US, if you go to Los Angeles, um, I think Dublin is getting more and more like that every, you know, every year. We, that sort of spread out, sort of losing a sense of, you know, where is the center? Um, uh, that's sort of a feature of more of US cities, this very, very low density compared to, say, a lot of European cities on the continent, which tend to be denser um, and more compact. So we're somewhere in the middle. Um, as maybe befitting where we are uh, on, on, on the world map too. Uh, so we are somewhere in the middle, but we are lower, den our, you know, lower density, more spread out than a lot of uh, comparable cities, yeah, for sure. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks for the, the question, Natasha. Uh, we have table, table 12. Hi, how's it going? It's just in response to the answer to this lady's question, and I may not formulate this so well, but just I'm going to uh, flow. Is 1.4 million the highest it's ever been, uh, the population of Dublin? And if you look at that and, and the way, you know, the cram tenements back, at, you know, 150 years ago, whatever it was, and of course, you know, we see so much development in Dublin city centre, as you mentioned, including accommodation. Then you see all these different colours that your students did, where Dublin's been sprawling, and one of the main things that's happened with that sprawl is the creation of housing. You just see housing estates everywhere, you know. Um, so I'm just curious, there's always a housing issue. Why is there a housing issue? H how long do you have to build houses and spread out? Uh, whatever about the density issue, ju just as a principle, how long do you have to keep building houses, spreading out, building upwards, whatever it is, that every single living being in Dublin has their own house and their own space. I, I, I mean, I know if you go back, similar to the tenement buildings where I grew up in Dublin, 
you know, the tendency was the families were larger, whatever the average was going through the decades. Uh, I think now it's down below two, right? It's one point something per family. So surely at some point you get to a stage where there literally is, and, and I, 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 I was kind of saying that sort of a little, a, a little sarcastically, that every single person would have their own, because that seems to be what the dynamic is, where a family would have had, say, six children or whatever in the 50s or 60s, that each of those children now want their own, uh, their own space for their own family or whatever. But I'm just curious, th does it just go on eternally? It doesn't seem, you know, pop five million population in the country, 1.4 million in a city, you know, you just look across the water, you've got 8 million in London, whatever it is, you've got 30 million in Mexico, etc. How is it not achievable just to actually provide sufficient housing for 1.4 million people, given all the housing that we already have through the maps that you showed? Wow, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a, a great question, it's a very valid, valid question. Yes, I believe that's the highest it's ever been, um, the, the population of the county as a whole. I suppose one of the things I've tried to show is that rather than being concentrated within the, the city-bound areas, um, it, it's spread ever further out, it, as you've said. Is there always a housing issue? Um, yes. <laughs> the nature of the housing issue has changed. I've been looking at housing for a long time now. Um, why? One of the big issues is the fact that Dublin is constantly receiving more people and it's it's the position of Dublin it's this idea of this primate city that the fact that Dublin is that there's a, an imbalance in the country that's created by everything being focused in Dublin and there have been various attempts a national spatial strategy if, if anybody remembers that um, and there have been attempts to try and plan uh, the country in, in, a, in a different way that stops this constant pull uh, to Dublin. But it's very, very difficult to go against those forces. And the problem is, if you have constantly have people coming in, you've got to provide them with accommodation. And that's an ongoing challenge, which is all... So, yeah, people do. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But also, you mentioned the idea of family size. So the household unit is getting smaller. So you might have fewer people, but actually more household units required. And what I described over the course of the 20th century, the standard was a three or four bed semi-detached or, or terraced house. Um, so we, we created sort of all of the houses pretty much for the same kind of standard family unit, whatever that was, whereas we've never really been very good at allowing for the fact that you have very, you know, smaller families, you have bigger families. We, we just created every, a very much the same kind of um, housing because, well, I'm not going to go into why because that's, that's a whole other, other, other thing. But yes, it's partly uh, because of this magnetic pull. It's the fact that Dublin is the, so uh, central, not just for the people who live in Dublin, but for the whole island that it is constantly drawing people in. So even at the height of mass emigration, you still have people in Dublin. There was one point in the late 1950s when Dublin Corporation uh, thought it had solved the housing problem and it stopped building houses. Very quickly realised that that wasn't uh, the case. Whether they're rented or whether they're purchased, how many actual houses and apartments do we have in Dublin to, to facilitate the 1.4 million? We do, or we will do very soon, thanks to uh, the CSO. Um, we've just completed the census, so we'll have up-to-date figures coming on, on stream pretty soon. And that will give us a really good picture because we haven't had a, a, a census since 2016, so our data is sort of a bit behind. Uh, but we will have, so I, I don't have anything here in front of me to tell you exactly at my fingertips the numbers. Um, but, and you mentioned as well about development occurring in the centre. And it is true that we had a period of almost a century when there was, well, not quite a century, but 75 years, when there was almost, n you know, almost no people coming to live in the city centre. Um, and that started to change in the 90s. So there are more people living in the city centre, but relative to what it was, it's still quite low. And increasingly what we're seeing is a sort of a transient population in the centre as well.
that's, again, another big, long uh, diatribe I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Was that, uh, Peter, is that from Peter or from James? Paul, was it? Paul, Paul, thank you very much for that question. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Paul. <laughs> Roddy, you, you, you've wrote so much about, uh, about uh, family life in Dublin, and you've, you've, you've observed it. Uh, and, any, any, any remarks on, on, on the housing issue that, that, you have, you, you, that you might want to share? Yeah, I wrote um, a film script four years ago, I think it's a film called Rosie, about a Dublin woman attempting, trying, over the space of 24 hours just to get somewhere for herself and her four children and her partner uh, for that night. And uh, it was based on uh, an interview I heard on uh, morning radio um, a few years before that. And um, what really, really struck me about that particular interview was that the woman was saying that her partner couldn't help her look for somewhere because he was at work. And it was an extraordinary thing to hear that this family that were behaving as, you know, traditionally we were supposed to behave. Daddy goes to work, mammy looks after the children. It was very old fashioned in a way, but the, the bizarre part of it and the, uh, the awful part of it was the one thing missing was a roof over their heads. And I think for a long time, I thought visually again that what I was seeing was the homeless problem that, you, you know, mostly men but also women, say, huddling up in uh, uh, shop fronts on Grafton Street, you know, after dark. And during lockdown then, we saw tents along Henry Street. I don't know if people saw that, just tents along Henry Street. It was quite an extraordinary sight. But when you go to a lot of, when you're, when you're wandering around and you, you, outside hotels and you realize actually there's families living in these hotels and they to me like are almost like the, the hidden homeless. And it's a shaming thing. It's just we're living in a great country with, uh, you know, we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world really. We're reluctant to admit it, but we are. But we don't seem to be able or willing to sort this problem out. And um, it really, one of the, I think we should remember the early weeks of the lockdown when things were, that were supposed to be impossible happened. You know, uh, roofs were found for the homeless. Uh, the divide between public and, and private health disappeared temporarily. The leaving cert no longer was vital. It could be bypassed much to the rage of people, but yet it happened. And so much was suddenly possible. And I don't see why that can't be the case with the, the housing problem as well. You don't expect it to be solved overnight, but it's, it's ideological, I think. It's a, it's a willingness to sort the problem out. There's an irony, I think, that in the dark days of the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, that we're now supposed to look at it, the horrible gray dark time when we were dominated by the Catholic Church, and you know, it probably was. But they were building houses all the time. How, like, you, one of the ones I'm really familiar with, St. Anne's Estate in Rohini, they would never build what they now call social housing or in that place anymore because it would be too valuable. It's beside St. Anne's Park, it's beside the train, it's beside the sea, it's got all these amenities. Oh no, you can't build the public houses there. But somehow or other, this brilliant estate was built there, and Kilbarrick, where I grew up, yeah. and a whole ring around the city centre. Like it was, you could do this, and I really don't see why it can't be done. Um, that's, I could go on all day, but I'd only be repeating myself. So that's yeah. really as much as I want to say. Thanks, Roddy. It's one of the fundamental, I suppose, areas that we'll consider uh, for a directly elected Lord Mayor. Does that person have accountability for housing? Do, do they get elected with a mandate for housing, for example? Um, any more questions from, from the floor? Table six. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Deirdre Donnelly. I'm a county councillor with Dunleary Wet Down County Council. Um, as Jim said, there are 12 of us here across different parties and across all, all um, four councils. Uh, here in, in, in the assembly as well. And I suppose my question is, it follows on from what Jim said, and first of all, thanks very much, uh, Roddy and Ruth, for two excellent 
very informative presentations. That, that was really fantastic. And my concern here uh, relates to the question Paul asked there in relation to housing. One issue I would see quite a lot in, in my area and elsewhere is every time a housing development goes in and there are thousands alone of units in my own ward, my own area, as a Stilorgan area, going in and no talk of schools, no talk of facilities, um, green spaces being used and taken from parks and taken from um, where we could have facilities and clubs, um, waiting lists for schools, waiting lists for GPs, waiting lists as well to join clubs for to get kids uh, out from, is it home hatchers? You're calling them whatever the word is, away from the Xbox and out. And I think it's a responsibility if we're going to build lots of houses that the other facilities are there as well, including public transport. And that's often something that's overlooked and that's the mess that the councillors end up with two years after people move into new homes because we get the calls and the emails about school places and about not being able to get into a, a GP practice or whatever. And I suppose the question really I'd have here is a lot of these issues are, are central government issues. Uh, councillors don't have a huge amount of powers, as you'll probably discover as, as time goes on here with, with um, our meetings. And the question I have is what kind of remit or what kind of responsibility will a directly elected mayor have? Because if they're going to solve the housing crisis, a lot of the issues that are there are central government issues. A lot of the public transport issues are central government issues. So what exactly are we looking at and what exactly you know, if we're, if we're going to have a directly elected mayor, I suppose the question I would have is, be, being realistic, what kind of powers would they have? Because we need to know that before we can work towards that. Thank you. Thanks, Deirdre. Um, question from Brian on table three. Uh, Harry, it's not really a question, but more a response that, uh, those issues are, can, could probably be dealt with at a planning stage, that if somebody is looking for planning permission for a housing estate, well, you can't build a housing estate unless you build X, Y, or Z. And uh, as far as I know, planning at the moment is a local authority issue. So if the local authority is having some issues with those things, it, I think it might be within their remit to say, you can't build X without that. And then, of course, you know, it goes on board plan or whatever, but it, it's possible to attempt to deal with those things at the moment, I think. Just, uh, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But there, but there I, I, so just sorry, just to go back to a question from earlier on as well, that, that our remit is to try and decide what we think the best solution to the current problems are and decide what sort of local government will deal with these problems in the future, as opposed to try and sort out the problems now. We're not here to fix the housing problem. We're here to select the type of government that will fix the housing problem. Yes. And, uh, yeah, so it's our decision. It, we shouldn't be asking the question, what powers will they have? We're here to decide what powers will they have. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Uh, question from table one. Uh, Stephen's winning. Um, just sort of following on from some of the other questions, and um, maybe this is something that you'll deal with later in the talks, and if so, just let me know. But um, are there any examples that we can po point to internationally where th they've done things differently to where it seems to be the, the same pattern repeating in cities all over the world? Or are there examples internationally that we can point to where they've arrested the problems that Dublin is facing? And if so, in the context of what we're doing here, was that based on, as the other speaker said, inter um, countrywide policy, or was it from a local government and what was driving that? Can I? Well, I can answer some of that, and I'll hand over to Art then. So, yeah, we, we'll be getting in uh, on, on the session, uh, our next session, we, we'll be inviting in um, some, Lord Mayor, some mayors from other jurisdictions internationally, that um, and, 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 and there's a broad spectrum of how that mayor was elected, but they'll, they'll also share their, their challenges as well. Um, we'll be hearing later on from some of our academics uh, in the uh, expert advisory group who will answer some of those questions, but I might ask Art and any, anything else to fill in there? No, that's covered it. 
that's pretty much it, yeah. So we will discuss those issues. Um, thanks, Stephen. Table two. Uh, hey there, this is Jason. Um, I grew up myself in North County Dublin, Swords. And just taking it back to the question, you know, what is Dublin? Um, talk a lot about what is Dublin in terms of the unity of Dublin regions, but I think it's important to consider the differences also there. Uh, so the question to both speakers is, uh, what is your current perspective on the level of socio-economic in inequality in Dublin? And what's your thoughts on where that came from historically and otherwise? Another really interesting and really big question. Um, one of the th tools I use with my students is a thing called the HP Deprivation Index, the Pubble Deprivation Index, and anybody can look look at those maps on online. Um, and they draw on census information uh, to you know, very complex data actually to to to, to visualise areas which are described as being more or less affluent areas that are marginal or um, more deprived on, on very various factors. So if you look at Dublin uh, city and county, you'll see a patchwork of these different colors, a very complex uh, pa patchwork. Um, and that patchwork is the product of generations of processes and of structural inequalities in society. And um, I suppose if we, if we go back to, to thinking about doing things differently and about lo local government and Stephen's question, um, one of the things that we've seen happening I in Ireland, and this is very much a personal opinion, now I'm not sure if I'm allowed to have opinions, but I have an opinion. Um, <laughs> you know, we have, I think, uh, had a very laissez-faire attitude in our society. We've let markets decide to a very great extent how the city is shaped and um, maybe have focused too much or allowed too much emphasis be placed on uh, the economic development and the benefits of corporations uh, and you know, big business to the detriment of the population. And um, I better stop talking before <laughs> I get into big trouble. I, I'd add, um, there's a big, uh, you know that phrase, who controls the narrative? Uh, it's, in, it's particularly interesting at the moment because there's a lot of talk about working from home and hybrids. And as somebody who spends a lot of time in the city centre, we need people working in the city centre. There are parts of the city that are dying. I, I, could, I can sit in a cafe all on my own in a place that should be full, you know? So there is that, first of all. And, but when you listen to the radio and read some of the newspapers, you would swear that we were just one big homogenous middle class. A politician, I won't name him, it's the man, recently uh, or in the last few years said he wanted to represent people who get up early in the day. <laughs> he didn't mean people who were going to prepare the coffee for the people who get up early in the day and have to get up even earlier than the people who get up early in the day. And I've been working on a book with um, Kelly Harrington. And she was talking about her work as a cleaner in a psychiatric hospital during the lockdown. And as she said in her own unique way, you can't clean a hospital toilet online. <laughs> you know? So I think a lot of Dublin's problems, and probably the country's problems, are caused by who controls, it's the words, who controls the words, who, you know, you, you, and it's entertaining radio, but you would swear to God that we were all one type of person. So you're, I think you mentioned the word diversity earlier on, you're bang on, and we have to constantly remind ourselves of that. I fall into the trap constantly as well about, you know, what is a Dubliner, you know? It's any, to me, it's anybody who wants to live in Dublin, really. And even people who don't want to live in Dublin, but are stuck. They're okay, too. <laughs> but it is who controls the, the, the narrative. And that's, of course, the debate everywhere. 
you know, it's roaring, it, literally roaring in different parts of the world. So, but that's why I think the diversity of this group is brilliant. As long as you agree completely with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Roddy. Uh, table four, please. Uh, hi, uh, my name is John Walsh. I'm a, a councillor as well. And just thanks very much to Ruth and, and Roddy for the, uh, the two presentations. And just a, a quick comment. I think a museum of sound is a fantastic idea, and particularly the seagulls. Um, so just, just maybe just to, um, I, I, I suppose, I, I think it's important that we look at the balance of power and responsibility between central and local government. Because part of the uh, traditionally local government in, in Dublin and in Ireland has been very weak and central government has been very strong. And that does explain a, 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 a lot, I suppose, about how decisions are made. And the other thing is I, I want to fully agree with what Ruth said, uh, kind of tentatively, ab about the, the role of the market in terms of housing. Uh, up to the 1980s, I suppose my, my day job is as a historian, and up to the 1980s there was really strong state support for public housing, uh, local authorities used to build homes uh, on, on, on a large scale, and they withdrew from that from the 1980s onwards. And, and that's certainly part of the explanation for the, the current housing crisis. Thanks very much. Thanks for that question, John. Just before we move on to the, there's two more questions back at the table, table, table 10. Um, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that the councils had the, the, the autonomy to build local housing. Um, a bit like um, Ruth, my, my, I, I, I am a Dubliner, as Roddy said, I'm born and bred in Dublin, I live in Dublin. My mum and dad are Dubliners, they, they, they also are from West Clare. They moved up to Dublin in the early 1960s. My dad was in, up in Dublin in 59 uh, with his brother in, in Glasnevin, but they, they, they bought a, a house um, in a small estate on the in rural Dublin, uh, on the banks of the Grand Canal, um, and this, this village had a had a, a church, um, a baker's, a, a, um, a couple of shops, a pub, obviously, and uh, that was pretty much it. And it's the name of the village was Clundalkan or Clundalkan. Um, so uh, when they moved, that was in that was in uh, in in in, um, in, in, count, in in the county of Dublin, very much a rural area. Um, and I'm not sure, was it was uh, because it, it, it was a great place. I, I grew up there in Dublin, in, in Clondalkin, a great community. Um, but the mishmash way of the way that that village or now was put together, uh, you'd have to ask questions. Well, one was a central government's problem. I don't know. You, you would hear that it was local local authorities potentially corruption, um, how the place is put together. So um, these, are, these are, I suppose, fundamental questions. Like from a central government perspective, I think in the, I think in the uh, and we'll, I'm sure we'll hear from the academics later on, um, of the 27 EU member states, Ireland has the most centralized form of government, I believe. And we're at the bottom of the table, so in terms of devolving that power out, but there's a, a balance to be got, I think, as well. Um, but these are really interesting things we're talking about, which, they, which, which this is where the rubber hits the road, really. Um, table 10, please. Um, we have two questions from Table 10. Malcolm Stewart. Uh, I'm very encouraged with what I'm hearing, and I, I'm interested to see that a lot of people are beginning to uh, voice their concerns and perhaps the reason they've got involved in this. But one big one is definitely, and it's a crisis, one big one is the housing accommodation for people. I hear it every day. And sometimes you get this feeling that you, you look at, say, something that's happening in your area and you're saying to yourself, how in God's name is that allowed? And they give planning for things and the next thing is they need the space for a road and they start pulling down properties that are, you know, built no length ago. And you say to yourself, are these gobshites or what's wrong? <laughs> and and you, get, you get frustrated and then you try, you try to be polite. And, and you say to yourself, do they, ever, do they ever engage in something called master planning? No, it's as if, no. And they have a whole cohort of scouts out there. They're called counsellors. But you know something? They get, they get disemboweled somewhere along the way and they don't get their voices heard because the, councils, the council itself is so powerful, it's nearly able to sh pick off their own scouts one at a time and nothing happens. And then you get these ridiculous decisions. I mean, I'm thinking of a road in my own locality 
Well, it's like Heinz 57 varieties. Every goddamn mixed up design you could think of. And you'd say, how could that happen? That's why I think it's a wonderful idea to perhaps bring in a bit of common sense and perhaps have a directly elected mayor who might have teeth. Now, you obviously have to protect them so that you have to control them so they don't turn into a Putin or a, or, 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 or a, or a, 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 a Trump, but that's very doable. And, and that's why I think that I find it very, very interesting that it's going in this direction because it's, it's felt throughout the room that there's something really, really wrong. So I'm just looking forward to the whole exercise. Malcolm, thanks for that contribution and for your frankness as well. It's um, important. So thank you very much. Uh, next question, please. Um, thanks. My name is Nicole. I suppose I'm just curious in terms of where we sit um, along other European countries, but how much I suppose the socio-economic background plays a part in government and how I suppose decisions and policies are made. I know just personally, um, my partner works in the construction industry and he's explained to me before that though there's rules in terms of for every, I suppose, 100 houses you build, 10% have to be social housing, that so many developers will turn around and go, look, I won't give you 10 houses here, but what I'll do is I'll give you 20 out of these 200 over in, say, Clondalkin or Talla in these lesser areas. So I am just curious where we sit and how policy is made based around socioeconomic backgrounds. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think we're stepping into, to, to, which is great uh, this afternoon, Dr. Breed uh, Quinn, is going to talk to us about who governs and, and how that power is distributed. I think that should answer that question, but we might hold that for, for, for Breed. Um, and she, Breed is also going to talk just after lunch about uh, the main strands of activity and um, planning um, and uh, housing is, is, is on the agenda as well. Um, I don't know whether Ruth or Roddy want to come in there or any of those responses. No, okay. So we're on to table six. To, Table 11, yeah. 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 Hi, thank you. Uh, R Rachel Batten. Um, I suppose one of the key things that I see as a concern even before we start into discussing matters is the people participating in the room. I suppose the point that Ronnie made is, yes, there are people getting up earlier than the earlier people that are cleaning the toilets and, clean and making the coffee and in the retail shops. And I suppose the nature of this assembly really restricts a whole cohort of people participating in it because those people don't have an option to take a full day Saturday and Sunday. They're either working, they're sharing childcare between people. So what I want to know and how do we capture that huge key of audience that aren't in this room because it's simply not feasible for them to be in this room? Yeah, so we have, um, th thanks, um, thanks Rachel. We have appeals to people to make submissions, but will that land with, with those who are working so early in the morning? Probably not. It's something that we do need to consider as a group, and we will have a steering group elected later on, so we're all ears. How, how, and I'd be interested to hear, and probably even from the councillors who are at a local level, how, yeah, yourself, <laughs> how we could engage with those. But it's a really important point, yeah, those people who can't, just don't have the time. Uh, we're going to wrap it up very shortly because uh, we need to get into our discussions, but I do want to keep it moving on. Uh, just so those people, sorry, Brian, who haven't spoken before, so table, oh, yeah. table six. Good morning. I just wanted to... Can you hear me, yeah? Yeah, oh, sorry, thanks. Sorry. Um, Dublin has a great culture. And we're not talking about the culture of Dublin. And part of the culture in housing is that most people like to live where they grew up. And that causes a lot of overbuilding of places that people don't want. And I think you need to look at satisfying the cultural need of the Dublin people. Thanks for that. So your name is? Frank, thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Roddy, any, anything on that? Um, not really. I, I don't know what... It, it is true. I mean, I, observed, I, I grew up in Kilbarrick and I taught in the uh, Greendale Community School in Kilbarrick for 14 years. 
and I'm involved in the local football team, Kilbarrick, and I live four kilometres away. And a lot of the people who were involved in the football team played football for the team and now run the team. And a lot of them have stayed in the area. And there's that definite uh, wish, I think, to remain in the area you grew up. Whether it's a right or not, I don't know. Um, but certainly I feel... I felt when I was a kid, I always remember th there's the railway bridge in Clontarf, and you come up, you know, and at the time, a lot of the a lot of the land that's there has been taken back from the sea or robbed from the sea or whatever. When you came under the railway bridge, the sea was there immediately, and I always felt that rush, that emotional rush, home, even though it was another bit distance to home. And I think that isn't that the type of place you would want to create where everybody turns a corner within the bigger city and feels home, you know? Uh, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, Frank, but it's, um, yeah, and then, of course, like, we've got Dubliners who came from thousands of miles away, you know, and the Vikings in the first place. <laughs> if it hadn't been for the Vikings getting in the boats and coming here, we wouldn't be talking here anyway, you know? So I think that mix is what you want you know, somehow or other. Uh, okay, so I have one final question, uh, if I may ask, and it, um, it, it relates to Roddy, I suppose, the, um, sometimes there's a perceived divide within Dublin, and those from outside our county borders, from a, even from a sporting perspective, would, would like to see us not divided in four, but divided in 24 with our, <laughs> with, with our postal districts. Um, uh, but as I, uh, my answer to that was always, like, the Vikings came in, in, in 78 AD, so we've always had the biggest population on the, on the island, um, and we have won the Earl Ireland every year. But um, I used to bring the Dublin team to the Gibson Hotel, which is on the banks of the, of, of the Liffey, to try and you know, bring the guys from the south side, north side, and, and the west together. What, what, any thoughts on, on, on your, your perspective of the totality of Dublin and that, that perception of south side, north side? It's great. <sighs> The, whole, the idea, when you look at the reality of the river, now down at the, the Gibson, it's quite wide and it's kind of impressive. But when you go further up, it's like, you could lean across the Liffey, really. So I think yeah. there's a comic element to the idea that we divided the, uh, the city into north and south. And I think it, it's to the detriment of the west. Yeah. It's not literally unmapped, but it often feels unmapped, that it doesn't get a look in. You're either a north sider or a south sider. So there's that. So again, it, in, in recent years, I've had to kind of shake my own picture of what Dublin is or what it looks like, you know? But I think that's where the center of Dublin becomes vital because we always, I've been to Los Angeles and I don't get it. And people say, oh, it's brilliant, it's great. You can't go for a walk in Los Angeles. There's, you know, the pavements disappear or there's signs saying they'll shoot you if you walk on the grass. It's, you know, it's really, it's hostile in many ways. And you go in, there's nobody on the streets and you go into a shop and it's packed and you're trying to figure out how did that happen? How did they do this, you know? And, it, you know, luckily in Dublin, we've got the freedom of the place. And I think the centre is the vital thing. It is a sprawling city, for better or for worse, you know. But it's the, the centre, to me, has to remain somehow a magnet, a place where people go because they want to go there. It's a, you know, for those who live on the periphery of the city, it should be a great joy or a, an adventure to go into the city and just to feel that affection towards the city, you know. And I think there's great stuff in the centre of the city, but there's an air of decay about it at the moment. It may be true of every city coming out of lockdown, I don't know, but it's, it's kind of warped at the moment. There's an awful lot of hotels being built, and you wonder, again, we're talking about housing. How many hotels do you need? I mean, I yeah. could go on, and I know opinions aren't supposed to be... Uh, Express. Oh, please express them. That's what we want. We want people's opinions. Yeah, there's no, there's no such thing as a neutral anyway. You know, so <laughs> yeah. um, it's the. It, I love the divide between uh, north and south. I, I, I think it's great. It's, it's really. And my dad came from Tala, and my mother came from Terra Neur. So actually, <laughs> I've never told anybody that. <laughs> <laughs> Your secrets out, Roddy. <laughs> yeah. He reveals. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to go into our roundtable discussion now, uh, up to half past 11. And before we do that, I would like to thank um, Dr. Ruth McManus from DCU for giving uh, 
Ruth's presentation on Dublin a geography uh, and for Roddy Doyle <coughs> and his presentation on Dublin as a sound. My key two takeaways from, from Ruth's, Ruth's presentation was that um, you mentioned about the 18th century, Ruth, that, that Dublin was constantly, uh, was constantly made and remade itself throughout its history. Well, it continues to make and remake itself and we're living in that history. Um, and for Roddy, my, my key takeaway was that, uh, and, and, and I remember this the next time I'm getting the bus into town, which you, and I work in the city centre, is driver, that was flawless. So please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Ruth and for Roddy. And um, Ruth, Roddy, you're, you're very welcome to stay with us uh, for as long as you'd like. This is an open session. Your opinions have been uh, really welcomed by the floor. It's, it's a great start to the assembly. Keep expressing your opinions. We'll now leave you alone to have a discussion amongst yourselves and we'll um, have coffee at half past seven. Thank you. <laughs>